just some of the headlines that were written about me. Russell Brand is moving to Syria! I'm fucking not. There he is, ladies and gentlemen, Russell Brand. Hello. You said you fancy Jennifer Lawrence. Sure, she's a really beautiful Oscar-winning actress. I wouldn't go, I refuse to have sex with this glorious creation. At one minute I'm a fat little boy and I'm nervous and I'm frightened and I'm not good enough at fighting or football. I've been a junkie, I've lived on benefits, then I've been in Hollywood and like lived that kind of life and like sort of seen that and been inside it and flash bulbs out and, and camera lenses up against the side of the car and all the things that come with that. Hugo Boss made the uniforms for the Nazis, but he might not have known. <laughs> Did it ring any bells? <laughs> it's sort of a giddy thrilling, insane, enjoyable thing. And it doesn't surprise me that some people, it, that it either kills them or they can't ever, ever get out of it and they'll do anything to mm. hold on to it. So while I'm waiting to meet the Queen and she's edging along, shaking the hands of the other performers, I'm trying to remember all them rules, all them protocols. Part of my mind is thinking, grab a fucking tip. <laughs> I really wanted all those things that people want. I wanted to feel valuable and powerful and well off, rich and appreciated. And because I was lucky enough to experience those things, I can no longer live in the suspension of that illusion. I've been shown that it's not real. It's still attractive if you look at the things associated with it, like glamour. Glamour is seductive. I might get some little boost from one of those things, but ultimately, I will suffer. When I'm guided by, am I being of service? Am I trying to help other people? Am I being kind? Am I being honest? Then I start to operate in alignment with a set of values and principles that are older than me, that are more powerful than me, that are deeper than me. It all comes with loads of mistakes, errors, hypocrisy, not perfection. I know what I'm looking for a little bit now. Tonight calls for the two stars to be sacked as Ofcom launches an investigation. Uh, there were some of the things that you did back in the day and I just no, sort of don't wanted... bring those up. <laughs> There he is, ladies and gentlemen, Russell Brand yes, in the I'm flesh. True Geordie Podcast. The beautiful man himself. Hello. You're rather beautiful. All right, mate. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for coming. Thanks for coming. Yeah, it's lovely to see you. So you used to come here when you were younger then? Yeah, when I was um, when I was a kid, like I was looked after by a management company there. Uh -huh. Also, I went to drama school and that was round the corner. Yeah, you went to Amy Winehouse's drama school, is that right? Or one of no, them. It's not she a special heroin... No, 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 school for no, junk. No, just quite talented. Are you interested in acting yeah. and heroin? Yeah. Come to this job yeah, school. Now, this, I went to one yeah. around there where Tom Hardy went and Michael Fassbender. They were like Tom. Michael Fassbender was a couple of years below. So, like round here, yeah, it's so it's so weird now that I live in the countryside just to come into the just to come into the city and to you know to be to be. It's weird. It's like the memories are like physical objects strewn on the street, things that you don't think about unless you go back there. When you go back to them places. There it is, strewn with nostalgia. I could listen to him talk a while. Could Good you? nostalgia? Yeah. yeah. Keep going, keep going, Russell. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's not gonna, there's not going to be any questions. Great. We're just going to go, need us. keep going. Just reflect. Just keep yeah. going. Well, nostalgia does have the sort of same root as pain in it, yeah. doesn't it? It's like, like as you know, like analgesia and all mm. that kind of stuff, things for dumps. Do you, dump, do you feel any of that when you're around these areas that you used to knock around and when those times of your life were a bit harder. No, I feel gratitude. I feel, gra in a way, I feel gratitude for, sometimes I think about that, because like, often when you think about your past, if you were crazy and you've done crazy stuff, you think, God, what was he doing, that kid? But now I think, I'm grateful to him, because now I like live, you know what I mean? I've got like kids, I'm married, my life is calm. I feel like I'm moving in the right direction. And I feel like that little geezer, he went for all that, so that I could live this much more easy life where I'm more connected. Some of it was properly mental because, yeah, this is where I was a smackhead and a crackhead around here. So yeah. like this sort of, you know, a lot of them flat. There's a lot of them around here, if I'm honest. They're still, still going. They've, they've carried the torch There's on. There's a lot them. of Russell Brand wannabes, I'll yeah, put it that they way. Think yeah. they're, they're on the same trajectory. They're not. They're not. <laughs> Those they're proud not. traditions. <laughs> I come down, like, I come, because where I've come from, I come down the hill from Swiss Cottage and I went past a block of flats where Goldie used to live, I was reliably informed, mm -hmm. and where I once, while scoring, got shot at by what my mate Matt Morgan insists I always describe as by a tiny gun. Wow. <laughs> a tiny gun, because the sound of the bullet hitting the car was like, like it wasn't uh, like... Uh, could have still killed you. Could have certainly, I think if it, it could have chafed yeah. had it made impact. Chafing can kill. What does it feel yes. like to be shot at, Russell? 
Well, I've, you know, these are tough times on the streets. And I think the reason that my mate uh, insisted I would describe it as a tiny gun is to ensure that I didn't later down the line try to glamorise that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that yeah, period of my life bit, being very gangster. You know, you're talking about you're on the, the right track and mm. feeling like you're on the right path. Mm. You, you confuse me a little bit because most people who are in the game of uh, social media now and putting their opinions out there, they'd rather just be rich and not really have to do that you kind of you you kind of went the other way where you you had all the fame and then you thought actually I don't really want to do the whole pretending to be other people acting and all of that and I'm going to put my actual opinions across and leave myself up there to be shot at why why bother you know because you you could just chill enjoy life be in the countryside forget the world's problems I think Brian because what's real in the end because I've like because when I was a kid growing up in Greys and then when I was a teenager and a young man round mm. here on, I really wanted all those things that people want I wanted to feel valuable and powerful and well off rich and appreciated and because I was lucky enough to experience those things I can no longer live in the suspension of that illusion I've been shown that it's not real it's still attractive if you look at the things associated with it like glamour glamour is seductive you know like glamour as a verb vampires glamorize their victims you know so like those sort of things are still like they're attractive if you engage with them and indulge in them and even seeing your great success here the wonderful paraphernalia the bare brick wood floors throughout in a lovely herringbone pattern someone it's, noticed lovely see yeah. people care about interiors you know it's nice to be you know successful it's nice to see beautiful things but it's um it's um it's a demonstration of what's real it's not what is real in itself it's well easy to get like think about what's happening just for example with football it maintains its vision visceral appeal the real connection you see that with something like the ESL that people are enraged by it mm -hmm. but what is it most of the time betting companies advertising just the corporatized a sense of dislocation but something real remains within it so I've had a little life that show me I come from a normal background I've been a junkie I've lived on benefits then I've been in Hollywood and like live that kind of life and like sort of seen that and been inside it and flash bulbs out and, and camera lenses up against the side of the car and all the things that come with that and because like I come at it from a junkie and addict perspective I know that really there's just something in you that wants that wants that's looking for something and if you're lucky enough to get those things or see those things then you recognize it ain't real and so you the, the second part of your life if you are interested in awakening becomes about integrity and authenticity still comes with loads of some mistakes errors hypocrisy not perfection but it, at least you're at least I I suppose in this instance I'm, I know what I'm looking for a little bit now but you're tackling it in a different way aren't you like when you first did trues me and me and Lawrence were like massive fans of you, what you were doing and it felt like you were starting a bit of a movement there and you were really challenging the powers that be and you were becoming a bit of a you, they were a bit frightened of you because you were saying don't vote and shit and people were like yeah and I was saying it watching you like yeah fuck them what is the point um, they're all corrupt they're all crooks and then you sort of you kind of come at it from a different angle as you've gotten a bit older and gone a bit more like I'm presenting you with information make your own mind up and maybe not as putting your balls on the line to... It gets a bit scary, don't it, mate? Mm. Ain't you already had with your success, like what happens when you're in a different position at whatever level you experience it. Now, if you get involved in things that actually affects power and the flow of power, even in a small way, you kind of get a little bit of kickback from it. So because when I was doing that truce, I was still bouncing right out of the... the um, what do I want to say? The sort of the echo of you know being an actor and being involved in all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I was still running quite a lot on ego, so I, I was really excited by that. Like you know when like sort of the leader of the opposition come around my house for an interview when they're saying my name in the houses of parliament, Russell Brand. Like when the pr then prime minister has to coat me off, I'm thinking, hang on, this is mad. <laughs> my mate again, Matt, who I'm beginning to see is a problematic influence. Like he goes, like he goes, you're having such an impact. He goes, he's ridiculous. You're having this impact because he'd known me for a long time. It's ridiculous you're having this impact. He goes, I think if you said that people should vote, like that, you'd probably influence the outcome of the election. Some little part of me fluttered at that. Like, mm, I can win elections. Like a little bit of a mania inside me, still dormant, come alive. And I thought, well, I will endorse that Ed Miliband. <laughs> so because, like, um. Because of that, that sort of tendency towards madness, <coughs> silliness, 
you know that weren't the right time for me to be doing that kind of stuff because actually even though i'm being sort of a bit silly about my own like ego and that this is a mental mental time we've known for a long time we've known for a long time that powerful institutions and powerful interests are not actually benefiting the lives of ordinary people it's becoming clearer and clearer more plain and situations and channels like yours platforms like this one do present a possibility for a more open discourse it's hard to manage the the power that they give you to speak truthfully and honestly and openly the risks that come with doing something like that mm -hmm. the responsibilities that come with something like that and uh, and what uh, my or your or any of our limitations are as individuals you know you can only really be in the service of bigger things bigger ideas when for me when it starts coming about myself which can happen pretty easily i get in trouble yeah i've, I've seen you talk about joe rogan and some of the things he's going through now as he grows in power mm. in america and it's not something he's trying to do he's literally just being an honest guy a bit like yourself and they're coming after him mm. uh, in in the worst way actually like i've not seen a solo entertainer go through what he's going through where just by having a conversation CNN are trying to make out like he's a crazy man. It's unprecedented because yeah. he's in an unprecedented situation. Mm -hmm. A lot of things have come together, like the, the you know the platform, the success of that, the, the medium in general, and then the way that he has landed. I don't, I wouldn't claim to like. I, I know him a bit. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? I've been on there a couple of times. It's not like someone I know super well, but I know him a bit. And what I was struck by is he's grounded. You know, his background, obviously, as you're well aware, is in fighting yeah. and martial arts. And I think that gives him a different kind of grounding. He's not a person like... <clears throat> even the second time I went on there, when it was sort of a, already like a massive podcast, he already... Like, he's only got a couple of people. He's not, his operation ain't as swanky as this, you know? Yeah, we like, see. Yeah, <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> it's just like you know, him and blow. He's just <laughs> pottering around. He don't care. He's not trying to get anything. Like Sometimes when I think about, right, how do I reach more people? Yeah. How do I ensure success in this area? Joe Rogan, he don't do none of that stuff. He is, I think, like legit and authentic. And They like, must hate the fact that he's so, um, he's got so much integrity and there aren't, that the skeletons in his closet are so minor compared to the politicians that yeah. they're like, how do we take this guy down? You know, it must be doing their heads in. Also, because the, the, what he's achieving financially is, uh, you can't undermine that. Like Spotify, you know what their sort of priorities are as an organization. We have a sort of a rough mm -hmm. idea of the way that those the, that kind of milieu, that tech milieu, what their priorities and perspective is. But they can't do anything about it. This is what I think about the idea of ordinary people coming together. The idea of a movement emerging out of football fans and a new kind of uh, working and ordinary people movement. The real potential for it, even though in spite of the incredible odds and the amount of time that's spent mining your attention, distracting you, making you dumb, filling you up with stupid food. The fact is, is that the, the, that those we oppose have no real ideology. There's nothing behind it except gain and greed and power. So I really re remain really optimistic about the possibility of change. That little flourish around the truth time, it was sort of exciting for me. And now, as you say, I approach things differently and I'm, I'm glad that it comes across that way because yeah. I recognise my limitation. I think time. you're being responsible more so than before. But uh, the young guy who was, like, the way I was, I was, like I don't know, early 20s when I was watching you then, I remember thinking, but I like the fact that you were being aggressive and, and saying what I feel to be true, which is that they're all in it together. This is all a waste of time. And you really spoke to the generation. And um, I feel like now I feel more hopeless than ever, in fact. Do you, mate? Well, yeah. don't feel hopeless. Look, I, I, that's precisely what I was trying to do. Boris Johnson's the Prime Minister. Like, I remember him from Have I Got News For You. Now, he was good on that. <laughs> that's why we voted him in. He was really good on that. Yeah. He still loves a quiz. Yeah, he does. He's still yeah, well yeah. into it. Yeah, he Multiple. gets all the right answers as well. Isn't <laughs> it strange? Yeah, always. <laughs> Don't feel down about it. I know what you feel, because I feel it too. You yeah. feel like, well, what are they going to do? Get rid of Boris Johnson and then who? And what if Labour won? Keir Stark, what's that? What yeah. difference is it going to make? Yeah, yeah. There is no alternative. It's pretty clear that the way that the game is set up is to not give you a viable alternative. Absolutely. And then if you do protest, or it, then they shut down that avenue as well. It's to, it's to achieve a kind of stasis. Because when we feel like, oh, things are going wrong, things are falling apart. People that are in positions of power, things are not going wrong and falling apart. They're going exactly as they're that's supposed planned. to. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Spot yeah. on. Mm. But then they cover that by uh, Boris is the perfect example of someone who's the bimbling, you know, the struggling guy who oh he just can't seem to string a sentence right together. Bless him, you know, he, he's such a good person cover. for them to 
have as the front man for chaos yeah, because it, it it looks unplanned. It looks like he is just crap at his job. Forget COVID. Just start realizing that you feel more controlled than ever. And that alone means that when they want to take us further down that road, you're going to go with it more likely because of every all the mental training we've had in the last two years, I feel. This is what I bang on about the spiritual solution. The spiritual solution just means a connection to who you really are mm. and what's really important to you. And simple Sesame Street values like kindness, service, not spending your whole time every single day just thinking about what you want for yourself. If you spend time cultivating a relationship with your inner life, and by this I mean like say the Wim Hof breath work, meditation, getting yourself within yourself, recognising who you are, establishing what your priorities are and where those priorities go, came from who trained you to be you who gave you your set of values who told you who you are like to start to develop and cultivate a relationship with yourself because then when crisis comes when change even comes you you're come you know who you are you're coming from somewhere you know who your allies are you know how to move forward you at least have a kind of a some sort of personal vision while all of us are spellbound hypnotized again by the bad food by the additives by the bad environment just the other like you, you, in 24 hours you read like oh they're dumping raw sewage into the river thames and i feel like oh my god these are even minor things this is nothing on a global scale but the kind of uh, the sort of the uh, the lack of foresight the idiocy and greed that are just that just pass as normal mentality that you don't really sort of question anymore the lethargy of being in this world of thinking you can't do anything i believe that can only be overcome if you have some some kind of connection with who you are really again this is why something like football has a resonance people come together as a member of a tribe people come together with a and purpose of as members of a community there's a power in it there's a real power in it and this power can be utilized it can be directed and so that like i know what you mean brian and i feel it too sometimes i feel frightened sometimes and i feel hopeless but i really really believe in people I believe in the people of this country i believe there is a dormant force waiting to awaken how do you um the, the stage <coughs> i'm at now is i I'm, i might have been through a couple of times where i thought oh, i found that authentic element and then afterwards it was revealed to me that maybe I wasn't as authentic as I thought I was or there was a bit of a trip after that. And I think a lot of people go through that. They kind of, they would like to hit that authentic um, goal first time and then sort of live the rest of their life authentically. It can be a little bit tricky sometimes to find out what is authentic and know what is authentic. And that's always, I guess you, you find that out throughout your life, but how do you get to that authentic side of yourself and how do you know what's authentic and what isn't within that? What's you know, true, what isn't? Well, you see, mate, there are things that are revealed through having a meditative practice that cannot be understood without undertaking it. What I mean by that, say if you see the world in material and neurological terms, it likely awakens synaptic pathways that would otherwise be inaccessible. But see, I look at the world a bit more spiritually, and I would say that if you spend time in prayer and meditation, you start to know yourself different, and you start to realise, hang on a minute, I only thought that because that thing happened to me when I was a kid. That's the only reason I've ever felt that. Hold on a minute, that set of biases and ideas, that's been downloaded into me in the culture you can do this you can't do that these people are good these people are bad so that once you start to have that kind of awakening of like who put these thoughts in my head they're not even my thoughts then you start to be able to on a moment by moment basis check your motivation what is it you're doing and why i sometimes check in myself and think am i only saying this or doing this because i want something because i want people to like me or because i want power privilege prestige pleasure those kind of things when i'm in pursuit of those ideas i may temporarily be distracted or i might get some little boost from one of those things but ultimately i will suffer when i'm guided by am i being of service am i trying to help other people am i being kind am i being honest then I start to, mm -mm, what do I want to say? Operate in alignment with a set of values and principles that are older than me, that are more powerful than me, that are deeper than me. It's difficult to just be a little individual. And if your little individual life is lived within the confines determined by a culture that doesn't love you, that wants you like a dumb little commodity stuffing consumer, then what values do you have? But if you start to engage with very primal, deep principles, ancient values, then you're being carried by something. I'm talking really about a religious idea, or at least a spiritual idea, but not in a, I, I wouldn't say a doctrine uh, or dogmatic way where I tell you what you should believe and we all tell each other what, you know, and have a fight about it later, certainly not under the circumstances. But like, <laughs> What I'm saying is, is there is something in you you're trying to find that you've always been trying to find that you've tasted, touched and felt at different points in your life and then you get distracted away from it again. And that's certainly, in my experience, that's normal. Even what we've talked about already, like um, 
you know, with the obvious example of pursuing success and thinking that success means success in the eyes of others or mm. success means power to influence and manipulate other people instead of recognizing that real success is coming home to who you really are. He said to me, one of the men that teaches me, life is not, uh, a, life is not linear, we know that now, but neither is it a circle, it's a spiral. You will see the same things again, but it's hopefully with a deeper understanding or from a higher perspective. The, re the reason that myths and stories have a resonance, fairy tales, folk tales, spiritual ideas, is because there are deep truths that keep presenting themselves to us throughout history. Mm -hmm. That you're going to have to cross this river, you're going to have to go into that dark woods, you're going to have to confront the wolf. If you ever want to get to grandma's house, you can't get taken off the path. If you ever want to become the realized archetype, mm -hmm. the elder, if you want to become that, you don't fall down those traps of taking the money and the honey and the pink and the green and falling by the wayside. But, you know, temptation will come. Authenticity, I suppose, means moment to moment, who is governing you? Who's controlling you? What are you being dominated by? And I don't mean externally. I mean internally, even though, as we've already discussed, the external, um, the external systems of domination are, it seems at least to me, more potent than they have ever been. Mm -hmm. When I was younger, I went through a period of not having a lot of money at all. And when I got older and I got fortunate enough to have this situation, Amazing. I uh, I blew a load of money on uh, fast cars and rubbish like that. And then I sort of had a moment of uh, a reality check, you know, like what the fuck have I been doing here? This is all bullshit. Seeing how uh, together you are now and how like sensible you are, in your peak of heading down the Hollywood road, uh, what was it like? Pretty amazing for a bit, but like, because... What when, were the best bits? No, but tell us about the good bits. Do you right, know what I mean? Yeah, make bits. it a bit glamorous and appealing because we want some of that, you know? Yeah, because <laughs> I'm like a person who's just been to an all-you-can-eat buffet, ate everything, and then comes back and goes, you lot don't need none of this. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. Go to church, shut up, start yeah. meditating. Exactly. Right, I'm going to pop back for a bit of yeah. ghetto. Those yeah. pop stars are overrated. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't need to be doing that. That's shallow, that. Yeah. Sit down quietly, what, what was meditate. It like, you know? Well, listen, I'm just telling you, right? I remember, <laughs> like... um. Like it changed well rapid. I went on Jonathan's TV show. Like I was going, I was on that Big Brother program. I was on that Big Brother program and it was just like, and, and I was on MTV and stuff like that. I'd been clean about a year. So like when you just got off crack and smack, even a year, you're brittle and you're a delicate little bird man. You know what I mean? You're not all powerful. You did look like that at the time to be fair. <laughs> I yeah. mean, I, I, I overemphasized that yeah. with the crow hair and the eyeliner. <laughs> I actually went to university with a guy who literally, I met him the first day of university because that was like, when you were in that era, I was starting to go to university and there was a guy who had self-styled himself on you and when people said you look just like Russell Brand he'd be like oh my that's God. weird this is amazing he had sex with a girl once on a canvas who was on her period and he sold it as art so congratulations I feel like you've I inspired have some sort of commission Russell, that's, that's the kind of great say. art but back to your pop sorry yeah that was style. yeah you tell me you, you ask for juicy bits of gossip and then tell a tangential and unusual tale about a piece of menstrual you, art you might not have seen the podcast before but that's sort of what I'm here for so you provide yeah. tangents yeah. I just provide the bollocks uh, sorry go on about Hollywood uh, no no no, no I'm, well, enjoying, I, I'm here we for tangents know, too though, because yeah. like uh, you were going through clearly a lot at that time and yet you are a deep person. So you must have recognized some of what was going on. It must have been too fat. Yeah, of course it did. Because yeah. you always know deep down. You always know everything. It's all in there. The last words of the Bhagavad Gita are, I remember. Having had everything explained to him on the battlefield, Arjuna uh, has, been, has met Krishna, who is chosen above all other possible alternatives, all other possible allies and resources. And the last thing that, uh, that Arjuna says after Krishna said, this is the score. Don't get distracted. All the stuff, you know, you, we know what religions are. Let's not get bogged down in... By the complexity of the Vedas. He said, that's Veda with an A at the We're end. Not Darth Vader. Yeah. Grow up. It's right. Got some good messages. He though. goes, oh, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, don't put that mask on. Be nice to your kids. Um, like, uh, he says, I remember. I remember. So, like, it's all in there dormant, was what I'm saying. You're, unpa you're already home. It's already there. It's already all in you. That's the sort of, I suppose, a part of the relief. But I remember in a very quick period, it must have been 2006 because it was West Ham Liverpool Cup final. And I remember, like, it going from not being famous to being famous. And the things that that happened were I went on Jonathan Ross and I was funny on it evidently and I've watched it back and I, it was pretty funny and then like I um, when I next went to Upton Park everyone sort of knew who I was I went out of like proper excuse me famous woman around here and like paparazzi and being outside this building and paparazzi <clears throat> following us here it was like 
many people that pursue these kind of like a life of fame or whatever, there are some that are proper little artists, isn't it? That are just like, I just have to do the acting and I'll do it no matter what. Others, like me, I love the feeling of connection and performing and making people laugh. But there's no doubt I was trying to redress some psychological deficiency through getting attention and approval. Mm -hmm. So when that stuff starts to happen, when you're like, oh my God, that thing that I've wanted, when I was like, you know, it just took, it took so long as well. Because I first, I'd done a school play when I was 15 years old. And from that moment, I was like, this is what I'm going to do this is me then it takes ages being an extra agency doing stand up comedy night after night 50 quid nothing pubs around here getting barred from that pub around the corner fighting with people in the audience not coming off <coughs> most of those, on most of those occasions like, and then suddenly when it actually happens when, it, when there are like photographers outside your house when, when you are going places in fancy cars when people find you attractive and want to be with you and around, like it's overwhelming it's overwhelming and you're able to live in a kind of a state of distraction. It's, it's difficult to, you know what I mean? One obvious example is, you know what everyone will tell you? Oh, America, over there in Hollywood, everyone's full of shit and that, right? You've heard that your whole life, right? You know that off the art but now, even if you've never even been there. But when I first went there and I went around all the studios and everyone was like, you're fantastic, we love you. We want to do whatever you want to do, we'll do it. And like, I was like, everyone told me people in Hollywood are full of shit, but these people are actually really nice and cool and spot on, good judges of character. <laughs> yeah. When you're the center of it, of all that approval and that attention, it's very difficult to be discerning. Yeah. It's only after a little while when the true nature of it is revealed. So what it was like was, it was as if, what in my mind, because you're still who you are when you're a kid, no? Like one minute I'm a fat little boy and I'm nervous and I'm frightened and I'm not good enough at fighting or football. And then, like, next minute, I like, can do what I want and go where I want and say what I want. And, bit, and like, everything mm. I do is sort of important. It's <laughs> mental. It's sort of a giddy, thrilling, insane, enjoyable thing. And it doesn't surprise me that some people, it, that it either kills them or they can't ever, ever get out of it and they'll do anything to mm. hold on to it. Uh, it don't surprise me because it's a powerful, powerful drug. I mean, you were friends with Amy Winehouse and I think you used to drink around you. Yeah, she was... Be like a beautiful awake person I see her the first time I knew her like, like recognised because she was a jazz singer right I was mm -hmm. like who gives a shit about jazz do you know what I mean <laughs> like you know and she was I was like hanging out with like Carl Barat and people out of them kind of indie bands around that time like Dirty Pretty Things he was in then because it was just after Libertines but all like sort of everyone was defined by I don't know like Rifles and um, like that lad what's his name Girl with a Golden Touch what's that like sort of Johnny Razor yeah, like that's yeah. them yeah, yeah all of that that's what it all seemed to be Anyway, like she was sort of around there and I thought she was sort of sweet and lovely and unusual and strange, but I didn't pay that much attention. Then I went into the roundhouse and she like did some sort of drop-in thing with Weller. Paul Weller was doing something. And like just hearing her sing before, seeing, you know, when you're like, going up just trying to get into a venue, I could, the, her, the voice was so unbelievable and powerful. And then like, yeah, I saw it for what it was. I saw it for what it was. She was a channel, man. Like that's what you get from certain people. They're channeling. You see it in sport and you mm -hmm. see it in art. Like no one can do that. You can't do that. Mo Salah doing that. You can't do that. Like that's coming from somewhere. You couldn't explain to someone how to do that. And her voice was like that. And, um, you know, from then on, it became like I was clean for a little while. I'd see her around. It was pretty clear she was in deterioration. I tried to intervene a couple of times here and there, and we had chats and stuff. And I feel like I said to the people that I should say it to, the things that you would say mm -hmm. under them circumstances, like this situation ain't going well in my view, and it feels to me like the most serious consequences could be at stake if the most interventive actions ain't taken. And it turns out, that was right, but that, you know, obviously don't make me a soothsayer, it makes me able to read the symptoms of what was plainly happening. And it's, yeah, it's a shame because it's sort of unnecessary. It's, un it's unnecessary, it's mental, it's sort of mental illness. I know the specifics of her death are to do with alcohol and stuff like that, but in t the general thing is that's addiction. That's what happens if, you know, we all know people that are addicts, and if you don't take them out of that, if they don't, you know, with their obvious consent, compliance, obedience, willingness, take them out of that situation, then, um, yeah, that's, you know, that's how that ends. Isn't it weird how um, people who have these gifts, who are channels, seem to be also addicts or die early? Like, it, they, they, their light burns so bright, but then it burns out quite quickly. Um, People like Tupac and the, just even people who've been shot and killed, like you know what I mean? But um, you know the day she passed away and you obviously got the news. What was that like for you? Because 
you know, you've had this sort of association with her and you've seen it coming and you try to say things. And at that point, it's like, well, there's nothing we can do now. Yeah, it's like a sort of a, like a record scratch of, you know, like when people die that you love or care about, it's the, you know, it's inevitable, it's irreversible, they're still dead. You realise then when it's something that you believe is preventable, even though what does preventable mean mm-hmm. after the fact, it obviously isn't. You know, it obviously make, made me feel that I wish there were other things I'd done mm-hmm. and could have done. And as a consequence of that, now I do try to be very, very present when I feel like somebody's in that situation. And it has happened to me since then with people. There's been other people and I've, I've held in my mind the feelings of that experience, like from the... You know, just seeing her as a person I peripherally knew, recognising I was in the presence of greatness. Oh, she's dead now. You know, like f- when I see comparable things, I make myself available. I s- sort of speak plainly. And if the, if I have the access and opportunity to do more, then I do do more. Yeah, so like obviously with addiction specifically, that's usually trying to fill a hole that was probably created in you when you were younger, a painful one. What was that thing for you that were you were trying to... Or was there multiple things? Or It's a spiritual thing, mate. There's an absence in all of us because we live in a world that ain't set up for how we're evolved to live. Even if you don't look at this spiritually, we live in a zoo. We've got bodies and diets and systems of consciousness that were evolved for hundreds of thousands, you know, and if you include the entire evolutionary journey, millions of years to live in harmony with nature. I don't mean that, you know, they've put flowers in our ear, <coughs> sit around seeing Kumbaya. I mean, we, we can do that also. But I mean that we are evolved to eat the things that are around us, to sort of hunt or gather, depending, you know, there are ideological components to that, so, you know, I mean, I'm vegan or whatever, but like, that's hardly the issue at this point. We're evolved to live as part of nature. We are nature. We've been extracted from nature. And of course, I'm not an anti-tech Luddite person, but if you live dislocated from the reality for which you were conceived uh, and evolved, and some people would even say designed, then there is going to be a disjunct and a disharmony. Some people, and in fact the 12-step philosophy that I use to keep clean, believes that the problem with addicts is they, is they simply cannot cope without some kind of spiritual dimension to their life. But by spiritual dimension, so you don't think I'm in crystals and candles and bullshit, what I mean is connection to who you are, oh. connection to other people, connection to a sense of meaning and purpose. And look at some of the people you know in your own life, how many of them are suffering because of a lack of connection they just look like and anyone that's an addict you know what they're doing they're sat around even if it's people with money they're just banging stuff up their nose if it's people with no money they're banging it in their arm or whatever people do now the drugs have changed since i was young but really what they're looking for is meaning purpose connection these are ordinary things like and it's bloody obvious, isn't it? You're not evolved to live in this condition. This oh. is like there are things about technolo- technological advance and, and all manner of progress that are beautiful. But let's face it, when we talk about progress, what we're actually saying is progress in a few scientific disciplines to for the benefit of a particular strata of society where elsewhere there has been considerable decline, whether you mean ecologically socially in terms of poverty and breakdown you don't need me to tell you the stats around what's happening around mental health and suicide and addiction and does it i mean all these things are happening meanwhile people are like sort of excited about a new type of phone or whatever and it's, there's great ingenuity in these things but even an object like this one is packed with misery direct from the congo so you have to be awake to what aspects of reality you're living within me i felt like i was I think perhaps you, we'll never know, but perhaps I'd have ended up an addict no matter what because, you know, I had a mum who really loved me. I grew up in what I would des- describe as a single parent family. I didn't grow up around my dad, you know what I mean? And um, like I, f- I think like there is a wounding in that and I was looking for something. I was looking for something. And like once I found, once I started realising, oh my God, you can quiet down that noise with first for me like weed then booze then like a like i'm like a leaflet from the government then party type drugs recreational drugs to eventually crack an heroin around here you know like sort of like once you can numb that pain or change the way that you feel even then that is a remedy you are looking to solve a very particular problem but there are numerous ways to solve that problem there are the one another way is find out who you are join a group of people that are trying to do the same thing as you connect to a higher purpose that's a better way of living than dependency on substances or behaviours. It's just unfortunately harder. 
<laughs> yeah, first. Although, but like in the end, addiction is harder. You know I mean? Yeah, it, so yeah, it seems effort. easier at the start. And then it, there's, then it's like there's a bit like I tell people that are still using. It's better than what you're doing now. Yeah. Otherwise, I'll be using with you. I'll be using with you. Yeah. It's better than that because like in the end, it don't work anyway. You're still in the pain. You're still in the misery. Things are getting worse. You're ashamed of yourself and f- you're hurting people that you love and you think yeah. that you're worthless. All of that can all be remedied. It's hard. But what else are you going to do with your life? Some pitiful trudge to the grave without meaning what this is it this is oh. it you know it's, it's a, like a wake-up call in a way i'm very grateful lucky to be an addict because now i've got no choice i've got no choice for me it's either you know that pitiful life or become awake yeah uh, did you ever get close to relapsing in the time that you've been because you've been sober for a long time haven't you 19 years can yeah. someone grab the dog before they and <laughs> my dog's uh, being a pain the in the ass someone needs to just keep a hold of him cheers thanks <laughs> he said hello he's all right isn't he? he loves it ah he's a good little Big boy yeah. yeah this is your house yeah yeah it's pretty beautiful it's pretty beautiful do you think I could possibly have a cup of coffee or something like absolutely, that absolutely like mate, a double yeah. espresso or something yeah we'll get possible. that we'll get that no worries while we're sitting here we're looking at you with coffee we're like yeah go on for, go you've got it. A, I mean that's a ridiculous do you want, do you want this, array this of isn't a ray of drugs I'll have a drink of this if you want what a little sip that? of something it's like a little strawberry milkshake you're sweet you are you're a really mm-hmm. sweet person you'll be the uh, British Joe Rogan no I'm alright thanks man. he's probably got milk in that's it. sort of my vibe yeah definitely he's my dad basically but he doesn't know it that's sort of I'm hoping he wants the job. He can adopt me someday. You've got to find that, that um, men's mental health territory, you know, like of where wellness and fitness meet with mental health. That's the sort of territory. That's what he does. He doesn't think about that. But yeah. with the BJJ and with the sort of interest in like, you know, psychedelics yeah. and like, and you know, with his inquisitive attitude and his willingness to have them conversations, he's, yeah, he's really opened up some territory. You do BJJ. Yeah, because of it. I did the other, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, I do do that. You're pretty good as well. For, I've become you, you've all been right. for a while, haven't Limbs. you? Limbs. You've got to have the leaves as yeah. well. Yeah. That's what you've got to have. I've got, I'm a purple belt now, and I've become better at it. But you know what it's like, something like that, that you realise that you're getting better, but also that there's just a seemingly limitless potential for ongoing growth, and you're always aware of other people's incredible power like if you do it like against a white belt who's done a lot of rugby it's like whoa bloody hell or if you know like a black belt that you know any black belt or brown yeah. belt or you know or purple someone that's like same belt as me but younger there's, so, there's loads and loads of variables but it's it's put me in my body like nothing else before it's changed me did you have any moment of ego coming in when you started realizing you could fuck people up who didn't know shit yeah I loved that little bit, but that like, you can't have to it's know funny, that there's other people that, <laughs> you know, that can that you, fuck you up. Yeah, you're on the other end of that <clears throat> yeah. continually. Yeah, that, it'll keep you in check, but it'll also give you those little windows of, oh, right, okay. And, because you, obviously, for years, people will look at you like you're nothing to worry about because you're this flamboyant character who doesn't come across as a threatening guy. But now, you know, if some of those guys who previously thought they could fuck you up tried it, you would wrap your arms around their neck or legs around their neck and they'd go to sleep pretty quickly. So, do you not just fancy doing that once or twice? Yeah, just it's reassuring. Go on, give it a go now, now. see what happens. See who yeah. we can make <laughs> unconscious. Yeah, but I think, because for me, it's become it's come in alignment with all of those other things. Yeah. It sits pretty well with it because you have to... You know, like you have to be so present, don't you, with yeah. grappling? You have to be aware of every p- 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 like every specific moment. Where am I putting my knee now? Am I? When am I going to hip out? What amount of pressure is that? that you know, it re- demands of you such kind of presence. So that bit of me that thinks, oh, this is my opportunity to be like a superhero for a moment. Also, anything when I start thinking like that, I'm punished really quickly. I feel like because I believe in God and all that, I feel like if I'm in the service of higher things, God's got my back and would uh, everything would go right. But if I ever start I'm going to try and impress people. I feel like it will go bad for me. You, so you you believe in God. What kind of um, idea do you have of God? A, a limitless, benevolent oneness. That the consciousness in me right now, the experience of being me, looking out of my eyes at you, is the same experience you're having as well, but with the variants and variations that have come from your individual experience and probably some biochemical distinctions as well. But through meditation, we could achieve a place of oneness and connection. I believe that God is unity, that the reason that love feels good is because love is a truth, that there is a connection between people, whether it's the love of Newcastle United, your dog, 
talk a family member or whatever what is it is a kind of an attempt to unify and connect with that thing i believe that the physical realm the material world is just one bandwidth of reality for which we have the sensory instruments and because the only sensory instruments we have are for this particular material plane sight sound smell taste you know whatever that's that we think of that as the sum total of reality but it is not inconceivable that would that there will be other instruments that detect entirely different realms of reality and even within the stratas of reality that we can receive we know that bats and dolphins and whales and other creatures and cats see other light and hear other sound so we're living in a curated reality we know that people that have psychedelic or near death experiences encounter reality that's entirely different there are phenomena that are excluded continually from the conversation because if it's true that we're all one, then systems of hierarchy and domination and exploitation and destruction would have to radically review the way that the world is undertaken. If all that really matters is your life as an individual, you're born, you live, you die, like if that's all reality is, then why bother to cultivate a beautiful world? If the only things are real are the things that you can measure, then why explore the limitless space within us as well as the limitless space without us? When we talk about science what we mean is the area of science that is well funded no one's <sighs> spending a lot of money to discover whether or not inexpensive substances can heal mental health issues because we live in a profit driven society we don't notice or recognize that we live in a fundamentalist ideology you know when like sort of remember 10 years ago when people were much more sort of scared about radical islam and stuff when terrorism was the thing that was used to keep us in check back then those nostalgic days we talked <laughs> about like fundamentalism now but we <coughs> forget that we live in a fundamentalist ideology where we're constantly bombarded with co commercial ideas and an ideology that continually underwrites that when you cannot escape screens when you cannot escape the constant scream of commodification we live in a radical society it's a radical try and get out of it try and not obey it try and live your own life and then you'll see what, what the reality is you live within. So my belief in God is that what we call reality is only a small piece of reality and accessible to us within us is, an, is something that is very deep and powerful. C.S. Lewis, he was like, who wrote Lion, Rich and Wardrobe, all that stuff, he wrote a book called Mere Christianity. And in that book, Mere Christianity, he says, like, look, where do values come from? Where does it come from, the idea that you're meant to be kind to one another, that you're meant to be loving? He goes, you, you get one society where a person might be married to five husbands or wives, and you get another society where people might just have one wife. But you don't get a society where people are applauded for running away in battle. If someone gives up their seat to you on public transport and you don't say thank you, you know that ain't right. If someone gives you something, you don't give it back to them you know that something in your body lets you know people go out of their way to come up with ideas like reciprocal altruism we evolved because in the days when we was in tribes if someone done something nice so therefore we're rewarded there's so much complexity in anatomy just the evolution of an eye that it's it's beyond it's beyond material explication of course you can create a narrative around anything but the narratives that we create around a godless atheistic materialistic universe are fundamentalist they are a choice it's not empiricism it's not this is the facts it's this is a set of facts and by coincidence this set of facts advances the agenda of the powerful weirdly so i believe in god because i believe there are different layers of reality that are accessible and i've been in them do you um because I, I, i'm quite interested to listen to your podcast i think there's a lot of really great guests on there that you kind of you managed to explore people from the, the, the right, people like Ben Shapiro, and then there's people like Jordan Peterson somewhere in between that, and then there's people on the left as well. Do you think, um, do you think there is a, a, a particular ideology that's getting it right at the moment? Like, do, do you think there is, is Islam or is Christianity? Do you think those things are important in the world? I think that it's important to have a set of principles and values. I don't really have a favourite in fact, what I mostly believe is that people should not judge other people's sets of ideologies or lack of ideologies. I believe in a kind of libertarian anarchism where people should be able to form their own communities with their own values. And if you don't agree with those values, you should just go, oh, cool, all right. You know, like whether it's people's gender identity or people having a very strict religious set of principles if they're li practicing that within their community then i don't think it's anybody else's business but in order to radically change reality there will have to be some 
correspondence and some coordination and some co- collaboration. So there does, at some level, need to be a kind of confederacy. I feel that ultimately the big distraction that we're, that is continually undertaken is the fact is, like, say, just take the example of football. Of course, it's very easy to hate Sunderland fans or Tottenham fans or Millwall fans or whatever it is that you know. But it's sort of you know, really, it's kind of a game because you've got people that you love that support mm-hmm. those football teams. It's an artificial. It's an artificial difference. I think these differences are true with most of the talking points in the news around left right politics etc these days that what we have to look for is alliance because the people in positions of power the institutions that are powerful benefit from us continually being distracted by these minor notes so i think like if i was hanging out with muslims i think i would like listen to them and think oh yeah these are the things that are true if i'm hanging out with christians or buddhists or atheists or whatever i've got you know ricky gervais has been on here and he's been on my podcast and he's like a pretty serious atheist isn't he but he has morals and values and loves animals and seems to think there's something very sacred about animals you know and like so i just, and like and when i went on rogan and he's into hunting and i'm a vegan i think well i'm not going to sort of spend <coughs> my time arguing with this geezer about some little trivial point even though i really really love animals and i don't think i would be able to fire a gun at a creature's head i think like, that would be really <laughs> far out for me to do that but i still feel like well, why am i going to sort of like when with someone i so clearly agree with a lot about why would i bother to argue because that's what everyone else does right. so that that's that's 99% of the internet is right. there's your coffee mm, is you. is disagreeing with each other over the little things because to some people that's all they see not and, and like who you support that's it's the best kind of way to distract people from what is actually important it's also a route to money mm. if you if you can quibble over all these little things you Absolutely. can make 10 videos a day and yeah. pick up 10 people's little foibles <coughs> 50 different times you can make a lot of money through being critical of other people which you know granted i imagine we've done at some point sort yeah. of criticized other people of course we will and it's sort of something to laugh at. you kind of got to know what level you're on in it like if you're sort of mucking around it's sort of we know what's in our hearts don't we we know it's in our hearts when you're sort of tormenting someone if you're saying something that's sort of kind of comedically mean it's like you know when you're like ah i'm going to hurt you i'm relating so hard right now yeah yeah absolutely yeah it's, do you know what that's like Lawrence? i, I yes. don't know what it's like to say something comedically mean and then have people deliberately misinterpret that that's sort of a that's kind of the problem at the moment in comedy isn't it like i don't know obviously you hang out with rogan every now and again do you still find yourself um hanging out in those comedy circles as well because there does seem to be a bit of um well i think cancel culture now is, is right, making it so yeah. much harder to be a comedian like and you've got great comedians like uh, tim dylan for example who was pushing the boundaries but he's like the last of a dying breed. I feel like this, the next generation of comedians, their balls are going to be chopped off before you even get the chance to get on stage. Yes, I think so. I think that, that what's happening around that culture, it does feel like it's... Um, I mean, yeah, I don't get involved in it. That's basically my policy yeah. because... Do you mean the debate or in the, the comedy culture? I love comedy culture. I love comedians. I love people that look at reality and want to find what's funny about it or what's hypocritical about it or what's unusual about it or what's stupid about it. I, that's, that, that's how I look at reality. That's my natural mindset. When I'm doing content, like if I'm talking about something serious like Big Pharma or FD, FDA or if I'm talking about you know, political corruption or what, that, what those parties in our country suggest, I'm always trying to look at it comedically. That's that's where I really get my juice, you know. I love that stuff. Mm. Truth to it, yeah. But I feel like um, I don't want to like be quagmired in something that that, that limitless vacuum of stuff because I feel like well, okay, if you love, love, if you're happy, you know. Yeah. Like, I don't ever. I would hate to think that I said something that hurt somebody, but I. I but it does restrict you in your necessary. ability to nail things the way they deserve to be sometimes. And if you're having the nice, like let's say you came along now and you'd started your career now that would have been chaos. Oh, yeah, yeah. You would not have lasted, unfortunately. No. You would have probably been cancelled, called the worst person ever, yeah. and tossed aside and yeah. self-destructed, maybe. That's right. But I think, I suppose, I suppose what we have to say is that there are different, like when you talk about, say, Tim Dillon or other <coughs> comedians that you, you say are uh, challenging that ethos, I suppose what that indicates is that there are different terrains that are opening up that people can occupy. You know, and perhaps it's always been the same. Perhaps it's always been that these are things we talk about. These are things we recognise can't be spoken about mm. publicly. But I would refer, like for me that earlier point is important. If there is love in your heart and you don't want to hurt people, 
then then I feel that there should be an open discourse around that. There isn't though, because the, the, like the way the way they the way they're getting it now is they they they're killing freedom of speech in the name of just just like what they did. One one great way to fuck people is to come at things in the name of something else. Save the NHS. Mm. Save the NHS. This is what we're taking away your freedoms for. Save the NHS. You don't want to do do what we do. Like you're, you're, a get, you're a bad person so they, they flip it and it's clever and just like with freedom of speech it's in the name of you're offending people how dare you offend people and, and it, it changes the argument and they put a, a slant on it that now means that we can't just speak our minds anymore because yeah. we're a bad person if we say things that like what I've just said about save the NHS and pointing that out that's pissed someone off somewhere already I, do I already know there's a comment right now i do think though uh, and this is what i was trying to sort of wrestle with beforehand because there is there's like a lot of different um aspects to your personality that in most people's experience of the media you should be just one of those dimensions so you should either be the funny russell the um druggy russell or the spiritual russell and not many people get many opportunities to show all of those aspects of their personalities so when you do attack a comedian, people know them as the funny person, but they mm. don't know the spiritual aspect of Bill Burr or the mm. human aspect of Bill Burr. And very often then when Bill Burr goes, oh, well, fuck you then, then it, that people go, well, he's telling us to go fuck ourselves. So that instantly the, <coughs> the, the narrative is one of conflict straight away again. I think you're right about that, Lawrence. I think that's a good way of describing it. And just take the couple of examples that have come up while we've been discussing it. You're looking for that NHS comment. Like while we're talking about with Bill Burr, he came on the podcast. And he's like, you can just tell he's like a giant hearted, beautiful person. You can kind of see that his personal circumstances suggest that he would be um, exempt from accusations of racism that I feel like have flown around. But he, he seems to be all right. Then he? he seems to be navigating it. You can see what's in his art. He's a beautiful, hilarious person. And like Ricky Gervais said, and I thought it's a brilliant point is when you say something that's sort of controversial, that that is the joke. That, that is the fact that it's insensitive. Mm -hmm. That's the thing you're honoring it in a peculiar way. And with your thing about the NHS, I think that's a very good example as well, because while we were being encouraged to bang pots and pans on our doorstep, what was happening is that it was being privatized legislation was being introduced to make it easier to sell the NHS to American healthcare firms, a plan that's been happening over the last 10 years since uh, like you know, an earlier incarnation of this conservative government. So while we're engaged in whether or not we're uh, certain people are using the right language and everyone's up to scratch and whether people are doing the right things and what's the you know where we're supposed to stand on particular registers what's happening is people in positions of power are cracking on it's it, in a way surely you knew that was happening at the time though because when you've been around long enough and you've paid enough attention as i know you have when everyone else was getting swept away in the you know bullshit that was being told to us about protect the NHS, save the NHS and hid hiding behind that as a way of controlling people you, you know, when when it came out that Boris was having parties with all his cronies and all of that and everyone's like oh, <laughs> the outrage of oh my god I can't believe he wasn't following his own rules, can you believe this I'm sat there going You've been paying attention, of fucking course he wasn't the guy's a bullshitter you actually believed him what do you want from me? Well, even, of course, that level of um, discourse is designed to keep it at yeah. a certain level, like so that the result would be maybe a different prime minister or possibly a different party, mm. but never, like, obvious questions like, weren't the function of those regulations to protect people from a health crisis? So not only is there the hip hypocritical component, yeah. but there is the suggestion that they weren't frightened to have those parties. How do you um, how do you uh, work with conspiracy theory where you come from? Because every now and again, I do see in your videos, you sort of allude to the Ikes of the world and those kind of people or, you know, that level of kind of person. Where does that fit into your thought process within all this? Well, I reckon, Lawrence, is it like the, the ideas that all, some of the ideas that change our reality and these ideas are here, some of them will come from within the mainstream. Some of them will be like from the great trade union movements and the power and solidarity and fraternity that is suggested by those kind of changes of the last century that were a response to industrialization. 
those things and some of those traditions are magnificent and beautiful and will be used. But some of the ideas that change the world are going to come from outside of the mainstream. They're going to have to mm. because we've seen what the mainstream is doing. So what I try to look at is... It's like, what are they saying really? What is that idea? Say something like, you know, well, it, JFK, that's a conspiracy theory, right? That that wasn't Lee Harvey Oswald that killed him, but the files around that case have just been booted another 75 years into the future. So whatever it says in those files, it, evidently they don't want people reading it <coughs> until like my kids are octogenarians yeah. because it's offensive. If you read that's what's offensive is the, is the limitless corruption and duplicity that goes on in the high levels of power, not the... Um, private choices of individuals and the private indiscrepancies of individuals without power. I always think, like before uh, allowing outrage into you, ha what power has this person got? And I, this is what I used to think with, like when it was a, a tension between working class British people uh, that were white and working class British people that were Muslim or, and, and non-white. I'd think, like, what power? None of these people got any power. Yeah. You know, like when you sort of people are talking about sort of Brexit and the the condemnation uh, and uh, sort of the patronizing attitude towards people that voted for Brexit or whatever, you know, I feel like it's only two generations ago that you wanted those, those class of people to believe so strongly that Britain was real, that you wanted them to send their sons out to die for that flag. And now if they have it out on their patio, you're taking the piss out of it. Mm -hmm. Like for me, I feel that if we are going to change society, we're going to have to come together in a way that we never have done before. We're going to have to be open to ideas in a way that we haven't been before, that we're going to have to countenance things that only really are housed within spiritual situations these days. Sacrifice, discipline, willingness to change. But the problem is, Russell, is fear is stronger than love, isn't it? And, and if there's one thing that that last couple of years has shown me, it's that to a degree, people will try and come together but mm. if it suits them and in their interests, and it's very rare that everyone's interests align, and that'll, it feels like it'll just that divide will be very hard to be broken. I suppose what we're going to have to do then is find a, a set of ideas, a manifesto, that would appeal to over 50% of the people, for example, mm. in this country, present that set of ideas and say that if we were in a position to promote and instantiate these ideas, this is what we would do. Then enter into perhaps the existing systems in a favourable way, recognise the kind of opposition that would likely be faced, anyone that was saying, this is how we would control media, this is how we would control big business, this mm -hmm. is how we would return resources to ordinary people, this is how we would create actual democracy where you control your own schools, hospitals, communities, where you don't have a life where that's determined by work, but it's determined by the experience of being alive. Reality can be a million things. It ain't just if you don't like capitalism, you want to go and live in Maoist China. If you don't like the music of Mozart, it ain't like, oh, what do you want? Put your in a bin and have someone bang an iron bar on it there's millions of different types of music there are millions of types of reality that can be created and the first thing that has to be done is communicating about it the second thing that has to be done is helping people to believe to have the faith and the hope that change is real and possible yeah. and then you've got to believe that stuff because um History tells us that if you say those things continuously, you will be killed. <laughs> it seems like you're going one level above uh, where the, the narratives actually say you're not really arguing about people. You're almost in a Jungian sense, like going above <coughs> and looking at the archetypes of that and then saying, oh, there is a lot of commonalities between people who are Christian and people who are Muslim. You guys should join together. There are a lot of, you know, uh, commonalities between working class Muslims and working class you know christians or whatever you want to call them you should you should not be picking over all the little differences it's the opposite of that that's exactly what i'm saying and it's exactly how i'm saying it that there are archetypal resources we're all doing the same thing we mm. all care about the things we care about by definition we all don't want to die we all love our families we are all attuned to nature we all even though there's limitless differences between us and you can see that by looking at us We've all got bloody skeletons. We've all got kidneys. People ain't that different. And I would say it's the same with the archetypal energies of consciousness. Yeah. Even though there might be variation, the structures are the same. So we have to acknowledge that what we're not, we're not striving for perfection. We're striving for something better than this. And if we can't achieve better than this, then uh, you know, we should give up. You, you mentioned uh, conspiracy theories. Uh, I was just about to say, yeah. Uh, What's your favorite? Um, b b now, I do like those lizards. Those I've lizards are the best I've ones. I've always been a, a big fan but, of but the lizards. The thing, right? <laughs> They're the best ones. <clears throat> Obviously, the, D uh, David Icke was the one who came up with the lizard people thing. And we've had him on the podcast. He's, he's fantastic. Wow. Yeah, right? I so, used to come on my radio show all the time. He's fascinating, right? And, and I remember you, uh, you interviewing him back in the day. Yeah. Um, but one of the things, like, for example, he said years ago was, microchips one day microchips and this week 
And in the in the name of COVID, microwave chips. <laughs> that that train's never late. Uh, right on schedule. Uh, microchips where they can scan you. Now, when when you read a, a story like that out on your channel, is there an element of you that's like a bit frightened of like fuck me? They are getting. You know, Ike was wrong about some things, but like some of these things are actually happening now. These silly little theories that everyone laughed at this guy for are actually being propositioned as real things. Yeah, that's right. Some of the m more Baroque components of that stuff. Mm. And, but, you know, and he's very vehement, isn't he, David Icke, if you've ever spoken to him? Mm. Like they, he likes that lizard stuff, and he <laughs> believes it's proper, legit, real. And uh, who are we to argue? Yeah. Now, you know, you'll notice that people, voices like David Icke and Alex Jones are sort of removed, kind of, and certainly heavily censored these days. But They've it, been destroyed yeah. as best as they could be, yeah. It's very interesting then to uh, put aside any um, emotions that you may feel about those people and then just sort of list the things I've said. Now, because there are so many things, but even take someone like Terence McKenna, who's not so controversial because he's not going out and direct he's still saying like he's that guy's a genius prophet you know, <coughs> like going on sort of psychedelic journeys and coming back with some powerful, powerful gear. But like, you know, like a lot of stuff he says is pretty crazy as well. A lot of things everybody says is crazy. Mm -hmm. Probably if you look at Martin Luther King, a lot of things he says and did are probably crazy or Gandhi. But like, uh, yeah, when you look at stuff like some of the predictions that we were moving towards a technocratic, centralized dystopia where technology will be used to limit the power of ordinary people, that doesn't seem especially it untrue it wasn't a million miles <laughs> off was it you know what i mean you nailed it really it's yeah. pretty it's 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 maybe they're all lizard people <clears throat> you know what i'm saying do Imagine. you think though that's ever like um you just look at that from a like you know a lot of people talk about what's the fighter that talks about um the uh, dan dan hardy's oh the reptilian reptilian thing, thing. Yeah. he talks about going the reptilian full, side of your brain and yeah stuff and like he that, talks yeah. about that i guess that could sort of be in a an allied allegorical way true that these people are more like lizards because they're a bit more cold i remember asking but do you mean, mean this in an allegorical way <laughs> and he no, did yes the actual lizards <laughs> but like, like, he, did, he did his hands should we this just say the, allegorical for there was the, the he actually god bless him he interviewed like this woman who was like yeah and then the royal family member shed its skin and like very much like if you've ever seen Men in Black where the cockroach comes out of the guy. Right. That was sort of what I was envisaging yeah. before the... But then a, another thing he was bang on about was like the pedos and the pie society and all of that. Like that's literally all... Ca so, so maybe... You know. Just go with them on it. And also there are all these Area 51s. There are categories called Top Secret. Obviously, by the, the, due to the nature of those mm -hmm. discussions, it is a controversial thing to speculate on. Yeah. But certainly, if you were to confine yourself to simply looking at facts, there do seem to have been some interesting things emerge. But again, we're not talking like the language of academia. We're talking in the case of Alex Jones or David Icke, with whom there are many things that I disagree. Um, there are some peculiarly interesting insights. What do you think about them being completely removed from uh, social media in the way that they have, for example? I'm just a, like, my personal feelings are that one of the best tools we have to create a better world is open communication undertaken in good faith and good heart. That's m my personal mm -hmm. feeling. That we should be encouraging conversations between people that disagree with one another so that we can discover that we are not actually that dissimilar and that we and have a lot in common. I think that's where the, the like, I'm, I'm not neither right nor left, but I'm, I'm an observer. I feel like, you know, I'm probably bang in the middle somewhere. But when I see, you know, the left are always painted out as the good guys, but one of the things that I'm seeing them do more and more is shut down that argument and talk about, you know, Donald Trump shouldn't be on Twitter and all of that. Then I, I, I get, you know, you don't like what he's saying and all of that, but I'm, I'm with you on that. Like, it doesn't matter what these people are saying. Like, if we start removing people's voices, it's a slippery slope to ending the complete conversation, isn't it? I believe that, I believe in truth and love and mm. really sort of simple ideas. So I don't feel that we need draconian restrictions i think that if we can create a society where people are loving and respectful to one another mm -hmm. and allow them to be who they are and are understanding intuitively and in an ed educated way where possible about the differences of people's life experience and sensitive to that i don't feel like we need to be afraid of mm -hmm. one another the heightening of fear cannot be 
good for our culture. It can't be. It's nice to be aware. There is a thing called wisdom fear, mm-hmm. where you're, the, you know, fear evolved in us for a reason to give us a certain amount of awareness of our environment and the challenges we would likely tackle within that environment. But neurotic fear, a spiraling fear that never ends, that can never reach a conclusion, that has no real target in mind, but other than its own sort of um, serpentine, endless coil. Maybe that's a bit of hope for us, though, because I think the British public particularly feels so lied to now. Obviously, the fear that we had shoved up us, by comparison to the people who were doing that, they didn't have that fear. We're we're starting to realise maybe next time these guys tell us, there's a fire, we're not going to be as worried about it. We're going to be like, yeah, okay, we'll believe it when we see it next time. Because they have controlled us using fear, and I'm hopeful that now they won't be able to do that as easily that we've seen what a bunch of lying bastards they are. Certainly we need our own channels of communication and our own systems mm. of connection that are not subject to that degree of censorship mm. and control. Am I being told to get out of here now? Am I being told that my... What, what we not like... for another <clears throat> 10 minutes, I'm told? Have we got 10 more minutes? Do you mind if I utilise this time to promote my... Yeah, um, go for it. ...enterprises? Yeah, go. Brian and Laura, Having said that, you. we do need to make some money here, so go ahead. <laughs> yeah, we are, this utopia will need some funding. So, like, I'm touring... <laughs> And I'm touring a lot in the north of our <coughs> beloved country. Can mm. I tell you some places where I'm doing my Go tour? Go for it. In my tour, <coughs> hold on, if you want, do you want me to do this in a less, because I'm doing it in a very open and do plain Do it in a way. slightly less, we once had Gabby Agbonlahor on the show <coughs> and he literally went, can I talk about my brand now? So mm. maybe we'll just, here we go. Oh. Russell, uh, you're on tour at the moment, aren't you? Oh God, I'd forgotten about that. Yeah. Tour, what do you mean? Yeah. A tour of the mystical oh. kingdoms of the inner world. Also, I wanted I to that comment. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> that's, how I, that's how I feel it. But also, I would say, this isn't, we've got two links, you can tidy this up. Like, uh, also, well, with regard to how do we progress, how do we come forward, how do we confront power? Well, it's funny that you mentioned that because I talk about these things quite a lot in my tour. Right, oh like, really like, you're on tour you're on tour oh you yeah, men- yeah you shouldn't mention that but if you were interested in coming to see me and escaping from the hellish cyber nightmare that your reality has <laughs> become i'm in bristol glasgow nottingham plymouth blackpool like the ones up until march they're mostly sold out but newcastle come see me newcastle yeah. it's not much uptake there so far so if we could just no yeah. it's good for april oh, right, okay, it's looking yeah. good carlisle sand center come there fifth of april that needs a right shove Torquay. <laughs> Princess Fear, 29th of April, and mm. Hull, Hull, on the 22nd of May, and 25th, I'm, on, I'm in Stoke. So go to my website, russellbrand.com, come see me. <clears throat> worst yes, ra- worst, worst patient to doctor in ratio in the UK, so those guys do need some care. Uh, there were some of the things that you did, but what, what, you know, in, in, back in the day, and I just no, sort of Don't wanted- bring those up. <laughs> What about my football podcast that I do? <laughs> Let's talk about the, the football, football podcast so is good. How are you feeling I mean, at the minute? West Ham fan. You must be loving life. No, because of Delighted. yesterday. How could that goal be allowed at Old Trafford when almost all of Cavani's hand is offside? <laughs> are you saying it's a conspiracy? His entire hand. Yes, it's a conspiracy. Yeah. Mm, have you like ever that. seen the way Cavani's eyes flicker sometimes? He goes, in, he's an interdimensional being. Yeah, like, um, no, I'm generally speaking really, really happy. Are you happy? With uh, how are you happy with Trippier? Are you happy with the uh, one nil against Leeds? I, 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 I am, and I'm starting to believe again. You know, I'm oh, starting belief. to think we, we might stay up. You're at that part of the cycle. Uh, Unity. Well, the team are now in Saudi Arabia. Uh, yeah, on that's a holiday. interesting. They're taking it. They're, we're actually literally going to go there. Don't worry, you won't even notice that it's Saudi Arabia. Oh shit, we're off there. What do you make of that? You know, the fact that Newcastle have been bought by. It, you know, a, a, a country that ne- doesn't necessarily promote all the friendliest of values. Mate, it's a bit like it's a bit like what we're saying with the Conservative Party, <laughs> Conservative <laughs> parties. Like it's like what this is what you know fo- we know what football is it's a commercial entity mm. like all things are and like yeah where's the where do you draw in the line not dubai but saudi arabia like you know like the the fact is is that the systems of economics that we have uh, prioritized and privileged chew through human yeah. life that's what they need to do it, so but, yeah, i don't think you can hand, make got, a special i mean if you're trying to make a special case i don't know yeah you've, got, I, you've got derby on the other hand who are about to go out of business as well so it's like if you don't have a lot of money pumped in through someone who you may not particularly want owning your club, you could end up going out of business. It's, it's almost like- as if we're seeing the end of the system that made all these problems <coughs> in the first place. Um, mm-hmm. Can I ask you uh, to pitch something to Brian? Yes. I'm always pitching to Brian about meditation and he keeps going, I don't know if it's for me. you got to do it. 
Why? Well, like it'll improve every single aspect of your life. Every single aspect of your life. It's the seat of your being. It's as important as exercise. It's as important as eating well. You've got to get to the very kernel, not even kernel, because that's like too sort of solid a way of representing it. You've Don't mention to- the kernel. I think of KFC. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking, and I'm sorry. <laughs> so you know when you sit there, do you? So what do you think about? Because I know you do the the voice. Um, yeah, the, the meditation. Oh, yeah, thing. that's another thing I can promote. Luminary, yeah. my. Uh, it's such a good guide. Yeah, I signed up to Luminary just for that. You're kind. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Lawrence. Cheers, mate. Well, there's like there's guided meditations on Luminary on my podcast, Under the Skin. And what the reason you should meditate, mate, is it'll improve and all every aspect of your life, every mm-hmm. facet of your life. You'll have a place to look at reality from, to reflect from. What am I thinking? I sit down quietly, I check the body, I check that I'm not holding tension in my face, in my tummy, in my legs. And then I bring my attention to the breath for a little bit. And you'll notice that when you close the eyes and relax and bring your attention to the breath, that all your mind is is just this cycle of thoughts. As that Joe Dispenza who come on my podcast said, 90%, 90% of the thoughts you thought yesterday, you'll think again today and you'll think them again tomorrow. We've been programmed, conditioned. When you're meditating, the part of practice is to learn to observe them thoughts and recognize that's the first layer of the outside world is your thoughts. It ain't even you. We think that we are our thoughts, but it's just an external <laughs> phenomena it's got matter it's got charge it's got energy not matter but it's got energy it's got weight you know so like you look at it as being outside of you eventually the thoughts start to abate there'll be times in meditating like, like even me i've been doing it 13 14 years sometimes i think i'm just sat down thinking with my eyes shut what's this what am i gonna what am that's I gonna what it sounds like this? when people describe it sat it? down thinking before oh, i should have done that i shouldn't have done yeah. that when am i gonna do that but after a while there is something else in there and it will change everything it will change the way that you fight it will change the way that you exercise it will change the way that you feed because it this is it. He said Eckhart Tolle when he come on. Because if you was describing this room, you'd describe maybe the furniture and the people in it, but you wouldn't describe the space. Your thoughts and your feelings and your sensations, they're the objects in the room. There is space, is consciousness itself. You have awareness. You are an aware being. And we don't cultivate or curate correctly what we put in that bloody environment. Fill it up with clap, trap and porn and crap the whole time. You know, we can change it. We can alter it and therefore alter reality itself. Within the field of your awareness, your personal awareness, is all history. You know, you see, you watch the same stuff I watch, so you know that we don't even know for sure that anything other than your own subjective experience is real. All of history, all your fears about the future, are all held in this field of awareness, as, long, as well as your sentience and your awareness of your own body, your thoughts, memories, projections, all held in your awareness. If you take care of this awareness, you can change it. You can change the environment within which reality is taking place. When you do that, I suppose it unlocks different parts here. I'm not saying it's going to make you more appealing to whoever it is you're trying to attract or anything like that. But I, did, I remember when I first started, I was a little, you know, naturally a bit further back down the old path. And I said to David Lynch, the filmmaker and person who set up the David Lynch Meditation Foundation, I goes, um, you know, but sometimes I'm like in bed and I'm thinking, will I look at pornography or will I meditate? He goes, meditate first and then the pornography <laughs> will be better. <laughs> exactly. Have you, I found the way in? I think you might right have found a great way in. Hey, Last the minute goal, hand that. offside. Because the thing that. is, he sold I, I get it. Like, but I'm quite a pious person. <coughs> and, you know, my voice is a bit annoying. So every time I try and pitch it to Brian, I feel like it, it falls on sort of ears. But I feel well, like I have listened to guided med- meditation, but you, but you I, get so much. But I just go to sleep. That's all right. You must be tired, mate. Are you working hard. Are you relaxing enough? Yeah. Not really. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, I probably work too much, but um. I, I like listening to um, people talk about things like you're getting healing from inside, and I'm just like, this sounds like some mystical bollocks, but I kind of like the sound of it, so it makes me go to sleep. You like Russell's podcast, then? Hey, watch it. <laughs> Who were you before you had your name? Who were you before you had language? I know the simple answer is a baby, but a more complex. Do you answer believe is your in their previous lives and stuff like that? Maybe I suppose I believe in limitless life and interconnectivity, and perhaps when people remember a past life, it's because they're attuned to some degree to a particular frequency of Infinite consciousness. Now. Wow. Um, I, now, I if you like, thought that was good, yeah. go listen to the bloody uh, meditations. I, I, do, I, do, I, do, I, I guess are we? Are we? Or what, what time we got? What we like? Are we begging Five for more minutes? time? Okay. Five minutes. Sorry, I just don't want to. I'm concerned about putting the, some of the David Icke stuff in and some of the cancel culture stuff. Do you edit this? With that? I see you got an edit suite in there. Do you fucking use it? Yeah, we do actually. Not yeah. particularly well. <laughs> are, you, are you? Are you worried about just stuff like careful. that? Yeah, that sort of stuff. Like, do you know what I mean? I like. <laughs> <laughs> you've, you've, I just got a nod in the background. Like, I stay away from it because I, I think because. Because you're walking in their little world there. You know, like, I, yeah. I, I, all day well, long. Well, you never endorsed him, though. 
all day long I'll say bring down the government of course I will no one cares but if you start like there's like I'll tell you why you might remember this well you do remember because you told me you do when I was doing all that trues and I went on Paxman do you remember that and he's yep. brilliant thank god god rest his soul Mark Fisher brilliant writer you should read his book Capitalist Realism it's little yeah. you read it in, in an hour and he explains to you how pop culture is used to keep you trapped and like how why people are killing themselves and why people are on psych meds and why no one believes anything anymore but it explains it philosophically he was a professor <laughs> of philosophy or whatever at Essex University he killed himself always a good sign when brilliant geniuses end their own lives you think, oh shit, David Foster Wallace, gone, this dude. Anyway, David Graeber, God rest his soul. All these people are atheists, they wouldn't want me, God rest in their souls. That Mark Fisher, he stuck up for me. During that time when I, had, when I went on Paxman, right, and everyone, all the media was mugging me off and that, like Fisher goes, Russell Brand, he's a geezer from a working class background, he's just took Paxman, you mopped the floor with him, right, and I thought, I like this bloke, he's sticking up for me, right, good. Mm. So I was really, like, touched by him, and I loved him. And I love him still. Well, then I like I got the hubris, as I told you. I started to take myself seriously. Hold on a minute. Instead of recognising that what I was doing is I was saying what everyone was thinking and feeling, and I started to think, I'm really getting across to people here. Now I don't think that no more. The best you can do is ident- like, be their voice. Be their voice. Don't try to tell them what to think, the people of this country or the world. They know what they think. They're already awake. They're awakening. It's all happening okay. I started to get a bit more self-involved, and I went on that Paxman again. They done me up. Not Paxman, though. It's the other geezer that looks a bit like he could be in Lord of the Rings without much makeup. He come on and he goes, um, yeah, but what do you think about 9-11? And I goes, I don't trust the American government. And like, God, she's got him. Yes, right. yes, it's out. Like, you know, as long as you're talking about, like, you know, if you're serious about changing the world, if you're serious about engaging different people in this conversation, you have to w- watch where you go and you have to watch what you say. Well, yeah, I can I can see the change. Like, like because of those experiences where they they use something that, you've said to completely destroy everything else and that's what they're looking for one yeah. one little comment one little joke about david Icke, one Discount little thing it. it's a shame isn't it? and for someone as strong and powerful as what you are for even you to now be sitting in this position where you are saying Ooh. nice strategy man like if you would like just think of it as like don't shoot for a triangle early do you know i mean otherwise you know they'll get the pass like you know like it's it's like i know because my ego would like i should just say what i want but i like i'm trying to i have humility now. okay so there is strategy right. in this and there is a long-term goal of yeah. change yes f- you w- through you know you using your platform and everything you've got what what is that long-term goal to empower people and create connection wherever possible to change the conversation, to help people to recognise that there are there's the possibility of creating new systems when the systems that we have are failing us, that there isn't a complete vision yet, that no society has ever provided a blueprint for like, and this is how mm. the Roman Empire is going to be, like it's going to happen incrementally and we can look at what the phases are and I believe the first phases are personal awakening and a willingness to communicate and form alliances with people that have a different perspective that's I think focus there first Mm. accept the possibility that any new political movement might have to pass through parliamentary process initially because the avenues are closed recognize it's going to be necessary to have the support of the police force the military the services that you're not going to change reality if they can just (laughs) line up a bunch of people with guns and shut you down so you have to recognize what are important to people that have those roles in life Mm -hmm. and to recognize the sacrifices they make and the service they provide that is why i love the military and the police force and i'm right on side with them and they'll always be supported under our administration Mm -hmm. like you know like so I think it's take it very, very slowly, very, very carefully. Populism ain't a bad thing, you know? Like, if you're... If you're able to change the shape of the conversation in this country, if you're able to alter power, if you're able to create voices against the institutions that evidently, clearly, plainly dominate at the moment, then you have to do that responsibly. Jeremy Corbyn, become the leader of the Labour Party, just got squeezed out like a little zit. You know what I mean? Like Mm. anything that could potentially provide any legitimate opposition is closed down. And look at what the the party has reverted to for a minute. In my personal opinion, that kind of previous century socialism isn't the answer. That's just personal opinion. I'm not, I ain't been a university. But my feeling is, is that we have to have a response to the technocratic, uh, we have to respond to technocracy the way communism responded to industrialization. So like we are going to have to emerge, get new ideas, discuss new ideas, make them accessible to a wide range of people Mm. and inspire them to feel hope again 
to feel hope again. And that won't happen if everyone who's presenting alternatives, meaning even in our own little way, us three, gets booted off the internet because they made some stupid comment right. about... <laughs> I, I guess one of the things that uh, is, before we wrap it up, uh, one, the way you've repositioned yourself now is mm. in a different way, not less trying to be confrontational to the system and more trying to influence from the sidelines a bit more. Um, do you not sometimes think, fuck it, I want to I wanna be more direct and and be a bit more in your face to a lot of these people. Like, because right now, you have a, I guess you connect with people in, in, in of all ages and you're in a really unique position. And people like Boris Johnson, they're there to be shot at. It's like fish in a barrel. Never has this been more of a, an opportunity, the way I look at you right now anyway, for you to be a bit more, um, to seize power in some way or shape or form if you wanted to go down that road. Well, I recognise my, like, I have been shown humility through humiliation, mm. and I've been taught, like, about my own fragility. And I recognise that anything that's coming through my little ego is of no real value to me or anybody else. So, what I'm interested in creating is alliances and strength and support and structure. I, have, since I was a little kid, always wanted the same thing. I've always wanted to realize truth, authenticity, mm -hmm. and integrity. And I want it still now, and I understand things better than I think I ever have done. I just think we have to be very... Uh, I'm more circumspect. I believe things will emerge. I think it will happen, and it might happen really suddenly and quickly. I just don't... I don't know. So I'm mm -hmm. just trying to be ready. I'm trying to be ready. But mm -hmm. I'm not like... My intention is not, well, hopefully I'll get to live a nice, quiet life in the country. You know what I mean, that's not the plan. Right, okay, because obviously you're a... By the way, I love that. You're a family man. And, I've got and, kids, I've got yeah, a dog, of course. I've got ten cats, and we might get another one. How do you fit time in for it's meditation? It's got no little but ears. What, 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 That's why, why I meditate, yourself... get the hell out of there right, okay. and meditate. I don't talk to those people, those yeah, cats, yeah. those children. That's a joke. That's yes. a, see that one? They would have that. One time I went, I think I went in some newspaper, and if I went, oh, no, I do change nappies, but my wife changes more. Russell Brown takes his pig, don't change Oh, fuck this lot, fuck them yeah. forever. They love that, the Daily Mail. Um, I'll, I'll wrap it up now because we're getting the, uh, the sign. Um, right behind me. Final question. Oh, this is, yeah. Uh, how would you like to be remembered? I suppose authenticity, authenticity integrity, mm. humour. These are the things that I'm still going for. These mm. are the things I'm still going for. I don't think too much about that. Sometimes I have a little fantasy about, God, I hope it'll be like Diana's funeral. But then I think, come on, mate. Calm it down. We'll all cry. Elton John, that. <laughs> we'll all cry. That'd be lovely, yeah. Goodbye, Sing England's rose. <laughs> Dodi Fayed in my arms. Yeah, that'd be lovely, yeah. <laughs> the bottom of an escalator in Harrods. You'd be incredible for that. Well, Innocent victims. That's what it says on that statue that you're referring to. To be fair. If we're know, talking about With Diana, some swans. Yeah. Um, yeah. The swans are involved if, in the crash. If we are to end on a conspiracy theory, Diana, there you go. Thank look, you. look into it. Just saying. Um, this was Russell Brand on the True Jody podcast. What a beautiful man. Thank you for coming on, mate. Thank you. It's Appreciate so lovely. It. Well done for everything you've done. What an achievement. Well done. <laughs> Thank well you. done, mate. And uh, also, we have a football show. We, uh, I know the boys would love to have you on our uh, live football show that we do. We do like a How many table. shows do you do? Uh, a lot. I got a fighting show, poker show, football show, podcast, gaming. fighting podcast, How many, gaming. You work every day? Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Do you have weekends off? No, no, the opposite. We, we work the weekends, yeah, especially. Yeah, I'd love to have you on a West Ham game. That'd be sick. Oh, right. Yeah, do like what we watch. Yeah, we do like that. live yeah, yeah. watch parties sort of thing. Yeah. That'd be, be good. good for that. Um, Unless you like poker. Do you like poker? He's just, he's just having a little. You're look just around. sort of assessing the room. Where'd you now? make your dinner? There. Uh, but I order it in. Of course you do. You maniac. You great man child. <laughs> I mean, look at me. <laughs> What's great. this like? Big, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's like when he gets an house in big. I'll have my own fucking studio. It's a that. cross between and big and, and, and Forrest Gump. You know what I mean? <laughs> there is a microwave in the corner. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's it's not, he cross, can cook some of his own food. Cross between big and Forrest Gump, you know. Um, life is like a box, box of chocolates. Life is don't, like a delivery. Don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching. You yeah, actually don't forget to subscribe. And can I do some promo? Absolutely. Go it. Go no, no, it. Well, Come yeah. see me tour. Sign up to my channel. Yeah. Believe in yourself. God is great. We can overthrow the government. Come and see me on tour. It's there on the website. Can go. we come and see you tour? Come for yeah, of course. Whenever yeah. you want to come, I'm Hammersmith on the first. To go, you we'll give you as many tickets as you want. Although it is sold out. Yeah. I might, come to like. Hull, I might come to Hull just to sort of, you know, get the crowd come going. Come to Hull. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> do you the warm-up. That'd be great. I'll need you now. <laughs> uh, thanks for watching, and we'll see you later. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you.